Okay, we're good. Uh, this is Don Schwartz. Welcome to the podcast, my friend. How are you? I'm doing well this morning. I uh, spent a few hours at the pool with some master swimmers, and that's always a nice way to start the day. That's awesome. Well, listen, uh, this is a huge honor for me because we have just recently uh, struck an agreement between my podcast and, and ASCA, the American Swim Coaches Association, where we have gone back and started to go through some of their old catalogs, uh, kind of dust, a, dust some old talks off the shelves. And one of the most famous talks in swimming history, ASCA history, is the one that you gave on the quantum leap, which kind of led us to kind of connecting again. And um, but yeah, we we put that out a few weeks ago, and it really hit because I, I, you know for those people that haven't never had a chance to listen to it, like because it's been sitting on a shelf for many years, uh, it's just one of those revolutionary talks. And it was so good to kind of reinvent it and reinvigorate it. I'm sorry that I used somebody else's voice on that one. We probably could have just got you to read it, but. Um, but it was uh, it had had a huge impact. And um, how did all that come about originally? Well, um, I had spoken at several ASCA clinics in the early to mid '70s, and uh, on, a, on a variety of topics. Uh, initially, on training because of the success that Rick Demont had, and then um, on other subjects, communication mm -hmm. and. Um, Topics like that, goal setting, visualization, right. all, of, all of those topics. And um, they asked me if I would do a, uh, a presentation for the um, awards luncheon. Um, now it's a big dinner, but in those days it was an awards luncheon. And mm. uh, it was uh, in the fall of uh, 83 in Las Vegas. And so um, they gave me pretty good lead up time. And I spent about six months putting that presentation together and mm. actually wrote, wrote, wrote it down and um, more or less had it memorized. I had my notes in front of me and, and I just have been spending some time with some of the writings from George Leonard uh, and, and people like that who were um, looking for answers as to how come some people perform better and in, in some settings and others, et cetera. And um, so that, that led me to the, um, uh, to the concept of uh, the quantum leap. And mm -hmm. um, some of that came from, uh, I, I had read a book uh, by um, uh, Gary Zukoff mm -hmm. called the dancing Wooly masters. And in there, he talks about uh, it's, a, it's a book about quantum physics. And um, I'm no scientist and I have very little interest in those types of uh, pursuits other than how they affect human performance. And so right. um, every swim coach has had a youngster touch the wall, jump up and uh, exclaim, that was the easiest thing I ever did. And it was the best time. And, right. they, and they said, I... I I'm not even tired. I could go back and do it again. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so how does that state show up? Um, so that was kind of the genesis of, of that. I was no longer actively coaching, though I was teaching workshops and goal setting and visualization mm. and those kinds of things. So mm. um, Amazing. That, that led me, that led me down that path. And I, um, you know, had several false starts with it, but it ended up with a, a, a pretty reasonable presentation. Well, it's, it's an incredible presentation and it's a reminder of uh, some really important things. Uh, and it's funny because when I, when I started this podcast and I started recording kind of swimming history through, through this medium that we're, we've got now, um, a lot of the stuff seems to be uh, rehashed, you know, and then when you go back and you, and you see your presentation on this, it's so detailed and it's so relevant to exactly the things that we still face and we still deal with today. You know, this is what, 40, 45 years later kind of thing. It's uh, it's incredible that we're just, you know, it's almost like we we don't learn enough from history. We, we should learn more from it, you know, it, but it seems like we kind of go through phases where we have to relearn history a lot. But your talk certainly um, touched on a lot of points that are so relevant to uh, exactly what coaches and, and swimmers are going through these days. I, I thought it was brilliant. 
Well, th thank you. Uh, you. When I look at it, and I'm still actively coaching with North Bay Aquatics, I spend time with the youth senior team as well as the master's program. And um, people are still interested in trying to figure out how to do this sport better. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means faster, and sometimes it just means more efficiently. Mm -hmm. We have a large number of people in our master's program who are, are getting slower because they're getting older. Right. But they're also learning to swim better so they can swim more and they can swim longer distances. And, um, you know, we have people that swim across Tahoe. We've had a couple of people swim the length of Tahoe and 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 other swims like that, uh, you know, the, the, the major channels, the English channel, all of that. And, and so while that doesn't involve much speed, it does involve learning how to swim better. Mm -hmm. And so when I first got interested in the whole swim world I, I you know brief disclosure i never swam competitively mm. uh, i played football and lacrosse and downhill skied in high school and a little bit in college i uh, had this vision of making the olympic team on a pair of skis and it was um, a sorely misguided vision wow. <laughs> you know, I, I, I had no fear but i had very little skill so i wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't able to compete with with other people um, mm -hmm. but when I got the opportunity to swim coach, um, it was uh, it was interesting because there are in in every swim team I believe is probably very similar to to all the swim teams that I've been involved with, including the one that I'm involved with today. Mm -hmm. There's a group of people in the pool, and some of them come because they like it. Mm -hmm. Swimming makes them feel good, and some of them like it for the social aspect. And some of them say they want to swim faster, but clearly by their actions, it's not that important to them, which is mm. fine. Mm. You know, the, the team can serve multiple uh, desires by the group, so long as they're not conflicting with each other. But um, I, I just, you know, I, I, I was, I was uh, in, in 1971 when I um, was in San Rafael and working with a team that was called the Marin Aquatic Club. Um, and Rick DeMont was one of the members of that team. And, mm. and, and I was struck by the, um, the almost compulsive uh, behavior of the swim coaching community, of which I knew very little. I just watched these people on the deck. But when it came to taper time, and everybody right. was like had was was really the coaching side was you know they were they were really concerned about making sure that they hit the taper and didn't mm -hmm. miss the taper mm -hmm. and of course i have no background uh so no preconceived ideas mm -hmm. and um i as i was learning what the taper involved and what it referred to um you know we went to our first couple of big meets um we had kids that, that had qualified for nationals and we would come back and other kids would say well how did they do and you know they either improved their time by a tenth or two or were, were, were close to their best time but they didn't do anything exceptional which is what you would anticipate or hope mm. for mm. at a big meet right and um you know, it's, a, it's like at the U.S. Olympic trial, something like, what, 30% of people improve their inner time. Yeah, I think it and may then, even be less than that. Yeah, yeah, they're all, they all go there with the in, with the idea that they want to, mm -hmm. but less than half the population is able to pull it off. Right. And so so why is that? And so, um, you know, I, have, I was in San Rafael at the time, and three of the top four race walkers were – at San Rafael High School, two as a teacher and one as a teacher's aide. And um, I got to be friendly with those three guys, and especially the one guy, Gutz Kloffer, who's, um, he's, he was a teacher's aide. And, you know, he's, was, he and I struck up a nice friendship. Mm -hmm. and he would hang out at the pool, and, and he said, well, so how's it going? I said, well, you know, it's not really going very well. The kids come down and they swim a lot and he could see that they were swimming a lot. I said, but we just don't seem to have what it takes to, to break through to the next level. Right. And she said, he, he said to me, do you ever cycle? Mm. And I'd never heard that word used before other than bicycle. Mm -hmm. And I said, 
what do you mean cycle? And he said, well, alternate easy days and hard days. Mm. And so this was 1971. And I thought, what do you mean by that? And so that led to a discussion and some reading on my part about Bill Bowerman and, and some of that stuff. Mm. And um, became clear to me quickly that it made great sense. And I somehow bumped into the, the work of Hans Selye, who's considered at the time anyway, the father of stress. And um, stress is not bad for you. Too mm -hmm. much stress of any given type is can be damaging to you. Right. But, but stress is a way to grow. And so in, in the swim coaching vernacular, if you don't work hard, you can't get faster. Right. So there's no way around it. Um, but you also have to rest hard, if you will. You have to rest so that you can reap the benefit of the work. Mm. And so that that physiology from 50 years ago, right, 1971, um, the humans, in, in, from what I can dis dis discover, haven't changed physiologically in the last 50 years. Mm. They're, they're not, their systems aren't different. Mm -hmm. They still respond to stress. They still respond to rest. And so how we take all of that and, and, and make it work so that we can become one of the 25 or 30 percent in Olympic trials as opposed to the other majority. How does, you know, how, how does that happen? And so that's what we're all after. And, you know, I had back in the day uh, one type of training that worked really well for several of the, the kids. Mm -hmm. It worked, didn't work for everyone, but it right. worked for several. And today the training has changed. Um, the emphasis is different. Um and as as coaches discover what works, because um, I'm a big fan of North Thornton's, and mm -hmm. um, you know, he once told me he said the best coaches are the ones that pay attention to the fastest athletes, and you you learn from the athletes. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna I'm gonna believe that this is true. I may be full of it, but um, Johnny Weissmuller, coach demanded that he swim with a completely straight arm. Mm, wow. Underwater. Like make sure your arms are like the paddle wheel off the back of the of, off the back of the river. Oh, that's so, something I've never heard before. And but Johnny Weissmiller, so in practice he would swim with his arms straight so the coach wouldn't yell at him. Mm. But in the meets, he swam with his arms bent because mm. he knew that was faster. Mm. Right. He was the first guy under a minute, I think, for 100 meter freestyle. Mm -hmm. um, and he swam with bent arms under under the water because he knew it was faster. Wow. And so, you know, when you're a coach, if you look at your fastest people, the ego side of the coaching often says, well, that kid's fast because of me. Mm -hmm. Well, probably to some extent, but that young person also is fast because they know something intrinsically or intuitively right. about how to fit in the water right. and move, move through it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, the, the really sharp coaches are the ones that are watching and, and even listening to yes. what the water sounds like as a swimmer swims or what they have to say about how they swim. Um had a girl last night have a couple of nice swims in practice. And she said, yeah, I do better when I'm not, uh, not so, so critical of myself. Mm. Okay. Well, we know that from the studies, the current studies of flow um, and some I'm sure numerous psychology studies, but it was interesting to hear her verbalize that for the first time. So she opened a, a little door into her makeup that because I was listening, I hope to be able to use that as we move forward with right. the training. Right, right. And so, um, you know, I, I mean, I, again, going back to Nord, he talked about how he was watching. Um, uh, boy, sometimes I'm uh, oh, Matt Biondi. Oh, yeah. Watching Matt Biondi swim and how Matt Biondi would start his hand and put a little pressure on the outside of his palm, just mm -hmm. a tiny little bit. Mm -hmm. And Nort was watching that, and he, he said, why are you doing that? 
And Matt said, well, it makes me feel like I get a better grip on the water. Mm. Well, of course, there's a line of fascia that runs right down your arm between your bicep and your ar armpit, uh, mm -hmm. bicep and tricep into your armpit. And if you can activate that line of fascia, you have a better chance of gripping mm. with your lat. And the lat's a much bigger mm. muscle than mm. the neck and the shoulders. And Matt Biondi's picking up on that intuitively. But he just, you know, he just, according yeah. to Nort, mm -hmm. he, he just figured out how to do that. So, right. so that, so there's an example. Right. Um, so a lot mm. of swimmers now, you know, are, are swimming with just, just a tiny little pitch like mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. to get the lad involved and then they may straighten out. All right. But um, so I, I, th I think you really, you have to pay attention to what you see in front of you and what you, what, what, what your athletes tell you by the way they react to what you give them. Well, I'm learning a lot about one of my mentors now who was uh, Rick DeMont. And Rick DeMont swam for you. And I didn't know this. And I'm talking about a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, I didn't know this until a couple of weeks ago that you had an influence on Rick DeMont. You know, my my swimming knowledge and history kind of starts in the 80s. I, I'm a, I was born in 75. So I don't really know much about the 70s. And, and you don't hear much about the 70s, to be quite honest. It was almost like... The 80s was this was this powerhouse of swimming, um, and and maybe because they just have more footage on it, maybe there's more documents on it. I'm not sure, but the 80s seemed to be one of these uh, decades where swimmers just worked hard, and then in the 90s they started to figure out more of this cycle training. Now I'm I'm coming to realize something happened in the 80s because in the 70s you were talking about this, you were you were doing this stuff, you were doing one day on one day off type stuff with a guy like Rick DeMont who has an incredible feel and understanding and awareness. And in the eighties, for some reason, it must've been forgotten by all these coaches. Were they just trying to outdo each other in the eighties or what was, what was happening? Where did we go wrong here, Don? I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to put the, 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 the you know, the points together here, because if we're talking about this in the seventies, what was going on in the eighties? So I think that, um, Again, this is just stuff that I hear. I can't verify this at all. But Steve Jobs once said, the trick is to find out what is going to work for people five years from now, three years from now, mm -hmm. and then make it and give it to them, sell it, sell it to them, mm. you know. And so um, in the world of competitive swimming, what is going to be the thing that tips the next generation, if you will, or the next group of high performers. Mm -hmm. um, what is it that, that's going to make them do that? Well, Rick came to me. He already knew how to swim. Mm. And again, I have a WSI. I had, it's probably elapsed, a water safety instructor. <laughs> um, um, and I taught a few lessons, but, um, and I know how to swim. Mm -hmm. But this guy clearly, and others, know how to move in the water mm. so what could i bring to the table what i could bring to the table was a a training protocol if you will mm -hmm. that, that allowed them to, to make use of a their skill and b mm. their desire mm. um, i had several kids on our team back when rick was swimming who had beautiful feel for the water and ju they just didn't care about it right you know they could swim very well and swim pretty fast you know, they were junior national level qualifiers and, and they, they liked it, but it didn't mean as much to them as it meant to someone mm, like Greg. Right, right. Um, so, um, so you think, you think in a way coaches in the eighties were looking at what you were doing and saying, okay, that that's good. That, that worked for now, but how can we go beyond? And, and maybe it was a, it was a push phase in the eighties because the 80s to me is known as a time and era where it was almost survival of the fittest. It goes against kind of a, a lot of the things that you're talking about here. It, it was it was almost like each coach was trying to outdo the other one to see how much work they could produce. You know, when I talk to um, a woman like Mary T, I mean, the amount of work that Mary T was doing is, is astronomical, right, for this 200 butterfly. And she was having incredible performances, but but this, this, this was survival of the fittest in a way, you know, um, and it was very much like that in the 80s. So how do we get away from your theories and your philosophies and, and your success in the 70s that you were having? 
Well, I think because uh, because you can um, you can do an awful lot of work and overcome a lot of people with just pure work. Right. You know, I I, I mean, if you want to get strong in the gym, you have to pick up weights and you have to pick up heavy weights. Right. And that's the only way to get stronger. And um, it almost becomes uh, kind of a rite of passage or, or mm-hmm. ego thing where, you know, you, honor did, or you, something? You, you did 5,000 when we did 10,000, mm-hmm. you did 10,000, we did 12,000. Right. Mm-hmm. You do hundreds on the 120, we do hundreds on the 110. Really? Right, right. Well, we're doing mm-hmm. them on the 105. Yeah. That's swimming and, right there. Yeah. And, and, and along the way, a lot of really wonderful swimmers might get, thrown in the trash heap Mm -hmm. because they're not first of all the vet the events they swim don't need that kind of conditioning and second of all um it doesn't resonate with them right you know some people and we see this a lot now because water polo especially here in northern california probably not just in northern california but it's come to us finally Uh, water polo is very very popular and we continually have kids say, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to swim polo this, this fall instead of be on the swim team. Mm. And so and our response to that is, okay, go. That's, that's what you want, then go. Some people are games people. They like to play games. And other people um, like to train. Mm-hmm. And a person who can swim and swim really well can, but likes games, probably going to be a pretty decent water polo player. Right, right. Um, you know, some people really excel at cross country. Yeah, and they'll run track, mm-hmm. but they really like cross country. And some people like marathons, uh, and other people like ten k's, and some people like ultra marathons. Right, right. And some people like six day events, and every everybody's got something that suits them. And I think one of the jobs of a coach is to help people decide where they fit within the realm of range of possibilities that we offer. Right. You know, if, if you don't like to train a lot, you better be really fast. Gary Hall Jr. (laughs) (laughs) But but you got, you got, you got to be able to be really, really fast or you got to be okay with getting, um, 10th. Yeah. 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 And, and (laughs) so what we as coaches, I think, I think we're best served as coaches if we can find people who know how to swim Mm -hmm. and have a feel for the water. And then if we can determine what their interest is, 50 or 500, Mm -hmm. then can we help them excel at that? Don, is that something we can do, though, younger than what we're doing it? It seems to be that we're doing that uh, in college for sure, but we're not necessarily doing that in age group swimming. So we we still seem to be losing a ton of kids because we're not identifying them young enough in terms of where they might fit best. It's almost like a one size fits all still to this day. Wouldn't you say? Well, it seems to me from from just, and again, I don't go and visit other programs, so I could be way out of line here, but it seems to me based on the conversations that I hear on the deck uh-huh. from other coaches, yes, that the 12 and under is trained for the 400 I am often. 100%, yeah. And um, unless that kid's got great technique in all four strokes by the age of 12, I mean, I don't, I don't know how much you can improve a, a person who doesn't have this kind of flexibility uh-huh. to swim breaststroke. And they're not going to be good at 400 long course. They might yeah. be okay short course. Yeah, you can fake your way through a 50 yard breaststroke, mm-hmm. but uh, you know it's it's like Rick. Rick was really good at everything but backstroke, mm-hmm. and his brother Ken, who's an All American at Arizona four years, was really good at everything but breaststroke. Mm. So if you could have put Ken's backstroke into Rick or Rick's breaststroke into Ken, those guys would have been yeah. you know, really a, a substantial uh, challenge mm-hmm. in the IM. So I, I just, 
you know. It seems like we're not learning from history enough then. And I'm glad we're reviving some of these talks, especially the one you gave, because I think it's groundbreaking. And it was groundbreaking then. I, th I still think it's relevant because we're not learning enough from history. And I'm so, pr I'm so glad and I'm, I am proud that we're putting this stuff out there for people to um, reconnect with. And I'm, I'm thankful that you're here talking to us now too, to kind of reinforce some of this stuff. But, um, you know, I did see your induction speech uh, for, for the ASCA Hall of Fame. Um, congrats on that. You know, it's a huge honor. And I saw where Rick kind of did his intro for you and he, and he called you, uh, along with Doc Councilman as one of the fathers of modern day swimming, and as and as as an Australian, you know, I'm 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 an Aussie, and we we have a proud, rich history of swimming too. But we have a massive American influence, and it's not always known where that influence is coming from. But now I'm kind of putting the pieces together again of like you had an influence not only on American swimming, you had an influence on world swimming, especially in Australia. So, you know, in terms of this this cycle training that you came up with. And going through different systems on different days was certainly something that that I did my whole career. And it certainly had an influence on me in the way that I coached eventually and went on to to be a successful coach. So so something that you created in the early 70s from having conversations with people and kind of putting the pieces together and then taking the risk to go out there and say, well, I'm going to I'm going to implement this into my program. You you revolutionized swimming for the next 50 years. Well, I'm, I'm got to be careful about giving me a big head, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, and I remember sitting down, I remember thinking about the stuff I had learned through my conversations with Gutz Klaufer. Mm -hmm. And I spent the summer of 71, another mildly successful, unsuccessful summer thinking about all of this. And so I sat down with the team in September of 71. I said, we're going to experiment for six months. Mm. We already know we're, we're reasonably fast. We're, we're pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we could be a lot better. And um, I'm asking you, I was selling them. I was doing a sales job. Mm -hmm. And this is how it's going to be. And these are going to be the days when there won't be as much stress. And these are going to be the days where there'll be a lot of stress. And right. These are what the mornings are. And this is what the, you know, this is how the whole thing fits together. And let's mm. see. Mm. And the first thing that happened was um, they started swimming faster at early season meets. Mm. And I think you're seeing some of this now where a lot of the collegiate teams wear suits mm -hmm. early, mid See, they don't wait till till the very end. Right. Um, so our kids um, were swimming fast relative to what they had done before at that point in the season. And I think that gave them confidence. Mm -hmm. And me, along with several other coaches, firmly believe that the most important muscle in the human body is confidence. Mm -hmm. And so if you can get a young person to be fit, and know how to swim and how to construct their races and also be confident, then, then you got something to work with. Yeah. And so, I mean, you, you, if you follow football at all, Patrick Mahomes is mm -hmm. a very, very confident NFL quarterback. Right. And so even though he's got a bad wheel and even though the team is behind, he's, it's just, well, yeah, I'm behind, but it's not over. Mm. And so um, we have to we have to try to figure out as coaches um, how to empower, I guess is the word I'm looking at, how to empower our athletes to succeed, um, dare I say, beyond their wildest imaginations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I had a heavy influence from another man myself in in terms of um uh, uh david marsh was it was a huge influence on me and richard quick and, yep. and and david was influenced by richard before that so um both these men had a, had a huge influence on me in terms of this thing as well and so richard was was very similar uh he was he was a risk taker you know and it seems like you were you were in that same category at the time and when i started coaching i wanted to be regarded as a risk taker. I wanted to kind of revolutionize 
sprinting in in the world. I I came from a system where it was it was based around threshold training, and I just didn't believe that was the best way to to get performance out of out of get speed out of a swimmer uh, through threshold training. And so I I started to analyze uh, and started to talk to a lot of track uh, coaches and track athletes and compare you know because the the 200 on the track is is almost equivalent to a 50 freestyle in the pool right and so i started to look outside of our sport kind of like what you did and and not uh take exact copies of what they were doing but take ideas and principles and theories and and try to apply them to swimming and i i was very successful with a number of my sprinters in um, this idea around kind of uh, similar to what you're talking about in, in terms of the cycles and when to do things and how, how often and appropriately and, and when to rest and recover. And so I kind of went uh, an extreme way where we, we uh, were basically swimming once a day. You know, the, the whole idea of swimming once a day kind of started to come in the early 2000s. This was something that wasn't done in swimming. It was always a two time a day, uh, you know, event type thing, morning and night. Um, and, and we were swimming five, six times a week and having extreme amount of success through this experimentation. And, and it's, it's hard to kind of put yourself out there and take those risks because everybody else is doing something else and you hear what they're doing, you see what they're doing. So to put yourself out there, uh, it's uncomfortable, but I guess when we look back, we can say, well, we, we had a try. And I think that's, that's kind of what you're doing now. You look back and you can say, well, I tried that and. I'm glad I did because I just didn't want to do what the normal was, what everybody else was doing. And it seems like a lot of coaches get lost in that sometimes, don't they? Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure in some universities today, there are um, degrees or sub degrees that can be had in coaching, coaching theory. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I would be surprised if that Back back in the seventies, there was there was none of that. You you maybe studied physical education or maybe kinesiology. Mm -hmm. um, probably probably not much in the way of sports psychology back in the sixties and seventies that was available. But um, you know, I, I look at us in the in the coaching profession as being the sort of the mad scientist. You know, we're in the lab. Our lab is the pool mm -hmm. and our experiments are these young people. And um, we get to fiddle with how we approach preparing them to do that, which they say they want to do. Mm -hmm. And I keep coming back to that because um, I believe it is incumbent upon the athlete to at some point they have to make a declaration of intent. They have to say, okay, I am going to qualify for X, Y, Z meet. I am going to make the conference team. I am going to score points at nationals. I'm whatever it is. And then they have to find out, you know, what, what, if they make that declaration, what, what are they going to score? Are they going to score in the 500 or the 50? Why do, why is that declaration so important? You think? Because it um, makes a commitment Mm. I'm, I'm I'm making a commitment. I'm saying I want this. Mm. So for and you're instance, and you're, and you're verbalizing. It. You're you're basically yes. announcing it. Yeah, I mean, right now I plan to be at Olympic trials in Indianapolis. I have nobody qualified. We have nobody on our team qualified yet. Mm -hmm. But I've already made the declaration, and everybody's looking around saying, "Well, it might be him, or it might be her." And I'm going, "Well, it might be you." Mm. What do you, you know, you have to, you have to start somewhere. Mm. And I, in, in my experience of observing human sports performance in the, in the world of aquatics and other sports, nothing ever happened of import and was repeatable without a declaration of intention. Mm. I you love know, that. Mm. You know, it's like, it's the, the classic in, in, uh, Sport is um, Jesse Owen, uh, not Jesse Owen. Um, oh, help me. 1968 in, in Mexico City, the long jumper. Oh, Bob long ju yeah, Bob, Bob Beeman. Beeman. Bob Beeman was a 27 foot long jumper. Mm -hmm. and, and you can see this on YouTube. It's quite spectacular. Um, 
he goes down the track, down down the runway, takes off, and it's apparent to everybody who's watching that this is something extraordinary. And he jumped 29, two and a half. And he went around for days, weeks, and months saying, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. And he tried for three more years. He never, ever in his life jumped 28 feet. Mm. He went back to being a 27 foot long jumper. Wow. Because, you know, that it was just, it was too, um, too impressive and too lucky mm. a thing to have happened to me. Mm. And so how do I internalize that? How do I say, you know what? I am this guy. Mm -hmm. And on on an off day, I'll jump 27. I can jump 28 probably more or less whenever I want. And I'm still working on my my world record of 29. So you, you have to be, you have to set yourself up for success by believing in yourself. And it starts out oftentimes with a, a wistful, almost dream statement. Oh, it would sure be nice if I. Mm. At some point, you you got to say, well, you know what? I Maybe I should take that out of the future and bring it into the present or the near near future. Mm-hmm. And and then you, you make that declaration to somebody who can help you, perhaps your coach or your training partner. And then the coach has to keep the athlete honest. You're the one who said you wanted. All right. So so why don't you get your button gear and do something mm-hmm. about it? Yep. Yeah. You know, yep. So, so you got you got you got the declaration and then you've got kind of the, the accountability of that declaration, and then you've got the process of the steps. You know, the, these are the things you need to do in order to get that. You know, you right. can't just have a declaration and not have an idea of how you're gonna get there, but so you gotta you gotta put the steps down and then you've got to hold yourself accountable to that. Right. And I think you can teach that to 10 year olds, mm-hmm. you know, we're not, we're not talking about 10 year olds wanting them to go to the Olympics. We're just, if, if they want to break 30 seconds for the 50 free, mm-hmm. here's how you do it. Mm-hmm. You don't do it by bouncing off the bottom <laughs> and doing those, those lame starts that you're doing mm-hmm. and you're know, breathing under the flags. You know, you got to figure out how to do some of the, the skill part correctly so that you can take the intention. Mm. And boy, I'll tell you, there's nothing, very few things that are as powerful as having someone set a goal for themselves, even if it's not formal, right? They just make the statement, oh yeah, I'm going to break 30. Um, They don't write it down and spend time visualizing it, but they, but they make a commitment to themselves and then they do that and they go, whoa. Mm. Look what I just did. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe I could do more. Maybe right. there's other things. Right. You know? Yeah. I saw where you started and founded uh, this Creative Performance Institute in 1977, uh, and th- that in itself is incredible because it just stuff like again stuff like this really wasn't talked about. And then um, you know, so in this in this sense, you were kind of talking about the specialization of uh, goal setting and and um, anxiety management and i and i love that aspect of it too because oftentimes i would find that i could be very well trained i could have a great season but if i haven't hadn't put myself in the position to stand behind that block and have that moment of truth because the moment of truth is when you strip your clothes off you're standing in a swimsuit and and you're either right behind the block or you're standing on the block and i've heard you talk about this actually standing on the block looking down the pool and that's that's the moment of truth really and I, I found I wasn't doing that enough in my training as, as an athlete. I would go through and I would turn up to practice and I would put in great practices for months and months on end. And I realized during that time, I'd never actually put myself behind the block. I'd never stood up on the block and had to say, this is the moment of truth. And so when I started coaching, I started to get my athletes off the blocks, you know, two, three, four times a week. We would get up and race and we would have race days. And, and you had to put yourself in that position. But, uh, but I've heard, I also heard you talk about that in relation to parents, you know, the, the judgments they make on their kids. It's like you've never stood behind them. You've never stood on a block before. So don't judge your kids, right? Yeah. We have <laughs> – I remember particularly this one guy in, in my recent coaching uh, about 10 years ago. 
um, would stand behind the stand at the end of the pool as his swimmer was swimming and yeah, go, go, you know, and, and it's, it was like, we've all seen that. Right. Mm -hmm. And then if the kids having a, not such a great day, then it goes, a, go, go. And then if the kid's really not having a good day, the parent disappears. Mm. So I, 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 what I want to say to the parent, um, and I have said this uh, coll colloquially, Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, so you're on the office call, dad, mm -hmm. trying to close that deal. Mm -hmm. And your swimmer standing in the hallway going, go, dad, you can do it. Close the deal. Go, go. And then if the call's not going well, and then you can kind of get the body language from the dad on the phone mm -hmm. and, the, mm -hmm. and the kid kind of goes and walks away. I mean, it's that kind of, mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind of relationship. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I mean, th this is. For many kids, this is really an important piece of their validation of themselves as a, as a human. Right. You know, and you, uh, I remember a year ago walking away, walking into a meet and two moms walking out and one of them saying, I can't believe she added a second. Mm. And I thought, you know, this is a second right here. Yeah. yeah. And, and you're. And you're disparaging your daughter mm. because she went a second slower. Mm. That's like sitting down at the meal and going, this is, this is almost good enough. This dinner. <laughs> <laughs> no. Send it back. I'm not happy with it. <laughs> yeah. No, so, it's true. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's humiliating. I'd like to come it's... back to something you were saying about risk taking. Mm. Um, all high level performers are comfortable taking risks. Mm. They, they just are. And so you have to say, um, we used to talk about a catastrophe report. So you're faced with an opportunity to do something. And then you ask yourself, if I take the risk and I fail, mm. what's the worst thing that can happen? Right. If you can handle the worst thing that can happen, you take the risk. Most people don't know enough about baseball to know that when Babe Ruth held the home run record for decades, he also held the record for most strikeouts. Mm. And he's quoted as saying, Hey, if I fail to get a hit in a game or I strike out two or three times, why should I worry? Mm. You let the pitchers worry. They're the ones who are going to suffer later on. Mm. And it's that, it's that attitude about being willing to, you know, in the sense of swimming to get your butt kicked. Right. But no, the, the reason you did was because you tried a different method of approaching your race and you were successful in your execution of the method, right. but the method wasn't, didn't serve you well. Right. So you go, okay, well, that doesn't work. Then I might try it two or three times, or I might say that worked pretty well, but I needed to fine tune this particular piece of that swim to be able to pull off what I had in mind. Right, and I, and I think I think we're, uh, you know, it's it's almost like I mean, we, we see it now with our kids go take a, a uh, an SAT, and if the score isn't high enough, well, then they sign up for a tutor, so that they can get special tutoring to make their SAT score better because the score, you know, it's all about the result, mm. and it's not enough about the process, right. Right. And if you if you trust the process, you're probably going to be okay. Yeah, because everybody learns at a different, everybody improves at a different, you know. Yeah, curve. and uh, yeah, it's interesting when you listen to a guy like Michael Phelps too. He's so in tune with his performances. It wasn't it wasn't always about just him getting his hand on the wall first and and getting a certain time up on the clock. If you asked a, if you asked Phelps you know, where did, where did it go right or where did it go wrong? He could, he could detail almost every stroke and every kick of every race that he swam, you know, like at this point of the race, I didn't do this or I did this, or, you know, I had to, you know, very in tune with the process of the performance. Right. I'll tell you uh, the, the other thing about being really in tune with process is that it, um, it really helps you, drop into flow mm. um, and flow of course is that state where all the magical things happen 
and uh, or many of them, um, because if you're so intently focused on the doing and not the result, then you have a really, really good chance. I mean, the, the, back to our original comment about the kid who touches the wall and jumps out and says, that was the easiest thing I ever did. I could do it again. I'm not even tired. Mm -hmm. Well, physiologically, they're tired. They just don't recognize it. You know, they've got, they built up lactic acid or whatever systems are being affected right. by their physical exertion, but they're not aware of it. And the reason they're not aware of it is because they're so in tune to how it felt to be that way. Well, and you, you're a non-swimmer though. So how did you first latch onto this? How did you first discover this? Where, you know, how, how did you first realize this is a real thing this isn't just some fantasy here where kids are coming out and saying oh i didn't know that I didn't feel and i was just like yeah. how did you get how did you figure that out i had a conversation with my dad a few years ago who incidentally just had his 97th birthday yesterday wow still yeah. alive and kicking there you um, go. and um i asked him if he thought competitiveness was learned or was genetic and he said he thought it was genetic and I disagreed. I said, I think it's learned. Um, I don't, I don't know that there, I'm not aware that there's a competitive gene in, in your DNA. Um, there might be, but um, I think it's learned and I think uh, we all learn it differently depending upon our, um, our, uh, upbringing. This is me personally now talking. Um, I think that uh, we're, I think humans in, naturally are looking for approval. We, we like it when people say that was really good. Right. Or you, that, that performance in the school play, that was out of sight. That was terrific. So we, I think we look for that. And so then when we do something well, People say, oh, that was really good. Good for you. You know, and um, like I said, when I when I played sports in high school, I was fearless. Um, and so I just I don't know. That's part of who I am. And so when when it came to trying to fine tune this experiment of swim coaching, uh, I wasn't I wasn't happy being ordinary. You know, I just well, I, hang on, I, Don. You just agree with your dad right there. You just said I was uh, kind of intuitively fearless. So that's kind of what <laughs> your dad's saying, right? Well, I, I don't believe you. <laughs> well, OK, <laughs> well, uh, we're, we're talking about not learning from history here, Don. I and mean, we're talking to your 97 year old dad. We should probably listen to what he's got to say. I, I just think that. Um, I don't think people are born naturally lazy or naturally energetic. I think they learn the value of those kinds of characteristics as they navigate life. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I just, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I just think it's, I mean, I just, I like fast swimming. Yep, pure and simple. I, I like fast swimming. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm spoiled to have been around a bunch of it. And so I'm not interested in slow swimming. Yeah. I'd be a pretty poor age group coach because I don't have the patience to go to the CBA meet and get excited about some kid who, you know, finally did something. I get excited about a kid who finally did something. If he stood up at some point in time and made a statement of declaration, but, um, yeah, you know, I, I think, um, well, there's a lot of fast swimming going on in the world these days. Uh, you know, people are people are catching on and figuring it out, and and I'm glad. You know, we we are sitting here talking about the fact that we're not learning enough from history, but uh, we're we're picking some things up because there there is fast swimming going on, and it's good to see um, a lot of it. And and I'm I'm excited about the future. I love swimming too. I'm I'm passionate, you know, in terms of just swimming was always in my dna for whatever reason it's just there and i can't escape it and i can't walk away from it um even though i don't need to be on the pool deck every day standing there holding a stopwatch um i do love swimming and it's really um 
an honor to talk to you and, and the history that you've had and the impact you've had on swimming. So um, I really appreciate this conversation today, Don. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And um, I, uh, it seemed to me in the 70s and 80s that coaches were very willing to share what was working for them mm -hmm. um, in the United States. The foreign coaches, not Australian, but the European particularly, mm -hmm. they they had this sort of protective, we're not right. letting you see what we're doing. Now, of course, right. it turns out a fair amount of that was drug related. Mm -hmm. And so that would be a reason not to let people see what you're doing. Yeah. And, and that element, unfortunately, is still around today. Um, but I, I, I really think that I think everybody wins when people share. Right. Um, I don't know how many actual top secrets there are in the world of software and the world of um, venture capital and in mm -hmm. those in those worlds. Um, I am aware that there's a, a, a big competition right now for delivery between Amazon and Walmart and yeah. a couple of other companies that are going to get into that business because everybody wants everything now. Yeah. Um, and you know, if you can, if you can go online and order your potato chips and they'll be at your front door in 10 minutes, well, of course you're not going to get in your car and go shopping. <laughs> And so there, so there are probably some proprietary secrets in in those worlds, but um, I, I I think in the world of swimming, if 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 we're truly interested in helping all of us in this community, the more we can share, the better. Um, I know that many coaches, th their deck is open. There's probably some that th their deck is not open. Yeah. But, um, there there are yeah. there are many coaches who you know, would say, yeah, sure. Come on down. Come on down. Sure. Yeah. Well, down. there's, there's been a lot of coaches that have said yes to coming on my podcast and talking and, and opening up and, um, and, and there's been a couple that haven't, so we'll, we'll keep sure. working on them, but Don, yeah. but, um, yeah. but I appreciate you doing this and um thankful. And listen, you talked about the quantum leap, you know, 40 years ago or whatever. And, and I think you, you had that effect. And I think now, I think you're going to have that effect again. I think people are going to, look at that again and say they're going to start to question again of like well how can we make the next quantum leap and i think i think we're headed that way so congratulations on the impact that you've had and, and i appreciate this again okay thank you very much and um, keep your eye out for anything you can find and learn about uh, the flow states because i think that's going to be a big yep. big uh big yep. part of the impact going forward so absolutely all right thanks don appreciate it mate Thank you very much for the opportunity. Good to talk with you. All right. Take care. Bye.